Good morning. morning. What an awesome day, amen? Amen. I think we're going to be in the mid-60s. Sunshine. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Give it up for the Lord, amen? I, uh, um, well, I'll pray and then you can have a seat and I'll share the story so you guys aren't standing for 15 minutes. That'll work. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and love you, Lord. Thank you for the music. Thank you for those who are, who are just dedicated, Lord, to worship you and, and to make things happen. And Lord, I just pray right now that as we seek your face, Lord, that you would keep Satan at bay. Lord, that you would just keep him out of this building, Lord, that you would keep him away from us. Lord, as we look at your word, as we, as we learn about you and, and learn about your desires, Lord, and what you would have us to do. Lord, I just pray that, that, you, would, uh, that, that you would just allow the Holy Spirit to have free reign in here. Lord, that we would allow the Holy Spirit to have free reign in this room and in our hearts and in our minds. And so, Lord, I pray your hand upon this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You may have a seat. I will just tell you, um, last week, um, uh, last week was a great week, amen. We had our highest attendance ever. We had 126. Yeah, amen. Give it up for God. And, uh, and you know, of course, gave the invitation. And uh, over 12 people uh, accepted Christ last week. Amen. Oh, man, that right there. Whew. All right, ushers, if you would come forward and anybody uh, that... Uh, uh, do we have any first-time visitors? Any first-time visitors today? Hey, Amen. We got one over here. And uh, raise your hand so they can see you. Uh, Cooley, give our first-time visitor a, a gift. And if she doesn't like it, give her a second one of the same thing. And then <laughs> we'll... <laughs> God bless you. Uh, anybody need a Bible? If you need a Bible, raise your hand. And, uh, and of course, we have one that you can use. If you need one to take home, if you need one to call your own, you don't take these home, you let me know, and I will give you one uh, that you can have all to yourself and, and keep. Um, I will tell you this, though. This past week, um, how, let me, how many people here have ever experienced being spiritually oppressed. Not possessed, but oppressed. Raise your hand. Okay. Um, after Sunday, I uh, went home and I was just excited about Sunday service. Excited. I mean, because let's, let's be honest, guys. Uh, and by the way, we're getting ready to, to set a, a schedule a baptism. That's coming uh, in the next couple of weeks. And, and, and very few churches today experience uh, salvations in their church and even less experience baptisms. Do you realize that over 80% of the churches in America today uh, are only seeing, they, the, I know it doesn't make sense, but 1.2 baptisms. And then you're like, how do you get the point two? Cut the arm off, put it in, put it back on. You got the point two, right? I don't know how. It's like, uh, I don't know, listen, I don't understand how they do all that. Yeah, it's an average. I, don't, dude, don't ruin my fun. <laughs> <laughs> it is an average. For those of you who know, it's not an arm, it's an average. And, um, but, but the other thing, too, is that, that whenever, you, whenever you preach the Word of God, I'm going to tell you, when, when you preach the Word of God, people get saved. Uh, and I think the reason that most churches are not seeing salvations and baptisms is because most churches are not preaching the Word of God. And then I went down the road last week of the wrath of God. And, and, and I, was, I wasn't being specific with hell. I was being specific with the wrath of God last week. And, and when, when you talk about the wrath of God, you are, all of a sudden, you leave the feel good, you know, that touchy-feely, everybody makes me happy, comfortable, and smiling, and I leave church, uh, you know, with this, because uh, um, there's some pastors out there that they just, all they do is make you feel good, and, um, and people leave there with a false sense, <laughs> I didn't say shock. But, but people, people leave there with a false sense of security. And, and, and when, you, when you go somewhere 
And all they've done is make you feel really good. It's kind of like telling somebody, uh, how many have ever watched American Idol? Okay, so how many only watched the first uh, few weeks of just the auditions? And, and why do you watch that? Because you really want to see how bad some of these people are, right? <laughs> Be honest, right? You, listen, you don't care about the ones that can sing really good. You care about the ones who can't carry a tune in their shoe. And, um, and they get up there, and somebody, because they didn't want to hurt their feelings, or they didn't want to, um, uh, you know, they didn't want to, um, uh, like, suppress their whatever, they, they lie to them. And they say, oh, you can sing, right? How many have gotten up there and you hear them sing and you're going, oh my, especially when, when um, uh, Simon Cowell was on there. And, um, and somebody would come out and sing and he would just say, that was God awful. <laughs> like, where did you come from? And, and then he, he does this. He says, did somebody tell you you could sing? And they say, well, yeah, my friends and family said I could sing. Well, they lied to you. <laughs> That's an Australian accent, isn't it? But it's the only one I got. And, um, and, and, and so what happens is, is th somebody lied to them or just wanted them to make them feel good and told them that they could do something that they really couldn't do. And then encouraged them to keep it going. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm a realist. And, and in my world... Um, I realize I cannot sing. And if somebody were to tell me, oh, you sounded great, I know they're not my friend. <laughs> I know they don't love me because nobody would listen to me sing and tell me I sounded good. Even Jesus himself would say, my son, that is not your gift. Like, you know what I'm saying? And so as we, as we unfold the scriptures that show not just the love of God, but now we're talking about the wrath of God, and we're talking about sinful humanity. And, and, and we're, listen, we are, the depravity of man is, is incredible. And if I don't tell you that part, you'll never truly appreciate the love of God. And so last week, and, and it was really cool because, because, um, uh, there was some real good feedback on last week where they went, man, it started out dark, but by the time you got done, I completely understood it. And then, and we even had uh, one guest who uh, said, not only did they understand it and grab hold of it, but they raised their hand for salvation and then told Buck, because it was a, a friend of Buck's, and said, because uh, they moved south, right there, I didn't like them. And, um, <laughs> and so they, but they said, as soon as we get home, we're going to find a church. Yeah. Amen? Why? Because they heard truth. They heard they, they, they heard God's love. They heard God's wrath. They heard truth. Well, the next few weeks, guys, are, um, uh, oh, it's going to be, it's going to be truth. Uh, it's going to be good. It's going to be bad. It's going to be ugly. Uh, we're going to have fun. We're not going to have fun. Uh, you know, it's kind of, we're going to go through this whole process because as we, unfold this chapter now we're getting into the intense parts okay I, i'm just warning you don't you don't want to miss because this is probably the next few weeks is where you're going to learn the most so you don't want to miss uh but i also want to let you know that we're going to kind of get into the intense part of scripture now and and i'm going to try and lighten it up and have fun um and then there's some parts where you where we just can't have fun it's just because when you understand the depravity of man. Well, as we are going through this, as a matter of fact, I titled this one, The Pit of Depravity. The Pit of Depravity. I didn't do a, uh, a PowerPoint. I'll be honest with you, the, the, um, uh, this week, I, I, don't, I can't, I was telling Kevin, I cannot remember a time where I have been so spiritually attacked as I have this week, uh, to the point where it literally um, has has basically taken my breath away. I even told my wife, and and at uh, 
at 2 o'clock this morning, I'm going, I can't even preach tomorrow. I don't, I, I, I have nothing. I'm, I have nothing. And, and the crazy part is I've been, I've been studying out Romans for the last year. You guys remember, I, I told you a year ago, and, and, and I mean, I've gotten past 18 verses in a year, I can assure you of that. And, um, and, and here at 2 o'clock in the morning, I can't sleep, uh, can't hardly breathe. Uh, it's just, it, was, it was just really tough. And, and so um, my wife, she just, as lovely as she is, she, she, uh, I told her, I woke her up, and I said, uh, man, this is bad. Like, this is the worst I've ever had it. And, uh, and then she just laid hands on me and prayed and, and, um, and prayed for sleep. And, and then I couldn't sleep. And then when I finally fell asleep, I was having nightmares. I don't have nightmares uh, unless I do drugs. And I don't do drugs. And, um, and so all of a sudden now I'm starting to have nightmares. And, and I'm having nightmares of, of the church being attacked. I'm having nightmares of my family being attacked. And, like, they got really heavy. And, uh, and I, to the point where I, I, like, come up out of my seat or out of my bed and, and threw the covers off, like, ready to, to, I don't know, do whatever. And, um, and, and this is the way it's been going since Thursday. Uh, so from Thursday until this morning, it's been rough, guys. I'm just going to tell you. Some of you, um, and, and I'm, just, I'm just trying to be so transparent with you guys because I want you to understand, you know, how many, how many sometimes you just want to walk away? Yeah, you know what I said to the Lord this morning? And it breaks my heart to even tell you this. But I said, Lord, I don't want to preach this morning. I don't even want to be in church. And then I said, Lord, I just want to run. Like, I just want to run. Anybody ever just want to run? And God says, my grace is sufficient. Stay in the pocket. Stay in the pocket. And Lord, I just, I don't have a pocket. And he goes, well, then get in mine. So what I want to tell you this morning as we open this up. <clears throat> stay in the pocket. Because I know there's some of you, you want to run. You want to run from church. You want to run from God. You just want to run. You want to hide. Or maybe you just got saved. Or maybe you've been saved a while. And all of a sudden, you decided to do what's right. You know, you're, you, you cast off the old life and you said, you know what, God, I'm, I'm going to die to you and I'm going uh, to die to me and I'm going to live unto you. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, it seems to have gotten worse. Right? Uh, you might, you know, I, I was taught, I remember talking with Jesse, and he said, you know, we, we, uh, uh, we got saved, we got baptized, and we, we decided we're just going to start tithing, and we're, gonna, we're all in. And then uh, he wrecks his car and has this problem and that problem. and Because, and listen, I'm going to tell you, when you're sold out for God, you got an enemy, <laughs> Satan, the devil. And the reason that he puts pressure on us is because he wants us to run. And, and so I just want you to know, I mean, as your pastor, you're not alone. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm nobody great, I'm nobody special, but I am called to be the pastor of this church. I'm called and held to a higher uh, uh, standard. And I still want to run. Because, guys, the pressure mounts. And what I want to tell you is, hang in there. Hang in there. And so as we look at this, Understand that Satan is not going to be happy because you're going to have an understanding of God, an understanding of truth, and an understanding of sin like never before. And you might make a decision to go, I am going to leave the sin that I'm in, and I'm going to live for God. And man, he's going to hit you, and he's going to hit you because he doesn't want you to leave it. He, he wants you to stay in that sin because as long as you're in that sin... You're away from God. You're right where he wants you. And so I'm not, I'm, listen, you know, my pastor at home used to say, you can want to quit all you want. It's okay to want to quit. It's okay to want to run. Just don't do it. <laughs> like you can want to all you want, just don't do it. And so this morning as we open up the word of God, as we look at Romans, 
I just want you to know that. I just want you to know my heart this morning. Uh, I wanted to run. As a matter of fact, when, when uh, you guys were up here doing music, uh, I was back in the library, and I was praying, God, let me run right now. <laughs> like, I know there's nobody there to preach, but Milton can sing, and, and the band can play, and, and, and they can dismiss everybody at noon. I don't care, Lord, just, I'm going to run, and God's like, just get your tail over in there and preach. And I'm like, okay, God. So, listen, if this is really good, it's all of God, and I have nothing to do with it. If it's really bad, it's because I got in the way. Just letting you know. Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, please. Romans chapter 1. Uh, I, just, I just, you know, guys, uh, and of course, anybody that's been coming here uh, knows me well enough. If you've been coming here a while, I'm very transparent. I don't hide anything. That's a good and that's a bad. Uh, you know, um, uh, I like to explain things in detail. That's a good and that's a bad. We were talking the other day about uh, how sin uh, becomes, uh, if ignored and you keep living in it, it becomes a, 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 like a, it's like a pimple. You know, it starts out just little and red, not that big of a deal. But then as the more it grows, the more sore it gets. And then uh, if ignored, it can turn into a boil. And then, of course, that's like cottage cheese. And, and, um, and yeah, so you guys get it. And um, that's what's happening here in 18 through 25. That's what's happening. Let's look here in Romans 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Well, as, we're, as we unfold this, I, I want you to see that there's two words that if, you, if you're not careful, you think they're the same. And that's uh, ungodliness and unrighteousness. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Uh, as you read that, how many have went, well, it's kind of the same thing, right? Like, what's really the difference? Let me, let me explain it. Ungodliness is an act against God. Uh, it's impiety. It's, it's un, it, it is just being uh, ungodly and it's specific against God. Unrighteousness is living a sinful life. You see the difference now? So, so ungodliness and unrighteousness means uh, ungodliness is an act against God or toward God himself, and unrighteousness is just living a sinful lifestyle or living in sin or acting out your sin. And so there's your difference as you look at this. And he points out both because the truth is how many people, uh, let's just look at atheists, they are completely ungodly, right? It's ungodliness because it's an act against God himself. He does not exist. There is no God. And then you have unrighteousness. And that could be the Christian. That could be every one of us sitting in this room or, or, or not Christian. And, and you're living a lifestyle that is not complicated complimentary of God. It is not a good testimony. It's a lifestyle um, uh, uh, of sin and wrongdoing. And so he says here in 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all of that. And he said uh, against uh, uh, unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Of people who suppress God's truth, of people who suppress uh, uh, the knowledge or the understanding of God, of people who, who suppress right and wrong, because you know God has put it into every human being right and wrong. Every human being. And yet people go, well, you know, uh, if they don't know God, how do they know? Because God, listen, why do you think even atheists, which is so funny because atheists say there's, ab there's no absolute truth, there's no moral standard because we all came from apes, we came from, listen, your uncle might have came from a monkey, but I didn't, you know what I'm saying? And so, and, and, and they go on and on, and, and God says, wait a minute, I, I have put it into, in other words, in, you have it, you own it, it is in you, it is part of your makeup of right and wrong. So therefore, you are without excuse because God says, I have imputed that knowledge into you, into every human being. And what's happened is Satan has thwarted God's effort into, uh, uh, with man. And, and um, I heard you 
mentioned this morning the video of Paul Harvey. And, and, and here's what I want you to see. I want you to see how Satan, how Satan has uh, destroyed or, or has fed the depravity of man. If we have that video, go ahead and pull it up. To the process, and by the way, this was back in, I believe it was 1965. Way back. Yeah, some of you were only 30 then, or 40. <laughs> so, go ahead, brother, start it. If I were the devil, if I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness, and I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree, the. So I'd set about, however necessary, to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve, do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth, I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old I would teach to pray after me, our Father, which art in Washington. And then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies, and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves, until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions, just let those run wild. Until before you knew it, you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing, I'd have judges promoting pornography, Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, and then from the houses of Congress. And in his own churches I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who wanted until I had killed the incentive of the ambitious what'll you bet? I couldn't get whole states to promote gambling as the way to get rich. I would caution against extremes in hard work, in patriotism, in moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that swinging is more fun, that what you see on TV is the way to be. And thus I could undress you in public and I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. Paul Harvey. Good day. Wow. And that was in 1965. That he said this. And what are we seeing today? Everything he just said in an unprecedented manner. Well, as the devil is doing what he's doing, and we clearly see it, I mean, it's undeniable. Uh, you, you see, even back in, in 1965, it was still happening, what we have happening today, only we have it in a manner that is just breathtaking. And nobody is without excuse because God said, I've put it into everybody who I am and what I've done. As I unfold this, and I have to stick with my notes, 
um, as difficult as this is going to be for me today, uh, but but I, I need to do that. Uh, as you see, there's a great deal of preaching on God's love, but very little said about God's wrath. And then what happens is people confuse God's love with their own sentimentalism of, uh, and fail to balance God's love with his uh, other attributes. And, and that's what we see because if you listen to people, all they talk about is God's love, God's love, God's love. And, and God is love. God, listen, God is a loving God. In John, uh, 1 John 4, 8, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And in, in uh, uh, 1 John four sixteen, it says, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. We see God is love. And so we don't want to take away from that. We don't want to uh, distract from that. But here's the interesting thing. In 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, you know, we focus on love, love, love. God's all love. God's love. But look here in 15, it says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. In all your conduct, you be holy. And then he goes on, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy holy. And so we see that, listen, God says that, that I am love. Yes, I am love. Uh, but you know what? Because I am love and because I am holy, you need to be holy. You need to conduct yourself properly. But then I want you to see that God is a consuming fire. In uh, Hebrews 12, 29 says, for our God is a consuming fire. That's, that's the whole verse. For our God is a consuming fire. And so we see through Scripture, God is both love, and He's holy, and He's righteous, but He's also a consuming fire. And He says, listen, but, but this isn't a surprise to man because I put it in man. That One of the interesting things that I see, and Paul lists uh, two ways that God has revealed to man. And, and, and that God has shown man that he is love and that he's a consuming fire and that he's righteous and that he's holy. Uh, and, and so uh, one of the interesting things, and, and I'll show you biblically how we know that even the ungodly know that there is a God. In Acts uh, 28, 4, and I'll read it for you because I didn't give any of this to the sound, so they're not putting Scripture up. Not their fault, uh, but mine, guys. And, and, I, and I apologize uh, for that. I'm not justifying anything. I just didn't give it to him. And so, so forgive me for that. Uh, in Acts 28, 4. So when the natives saw, by the way, this is Paul. I don't want you to misunderstand what's going on, but, but Paul was shipwrecked. You guys, uh, remember when he was shipwrecked and, and then, uh, he, they were gathering up wood and he gets bitten by the serpent. You guys remember this for those of you who read your Bible. And then, um, I'm just being sarcastic. Okay. Um, and so, here, they're gathering wood. And it says here, so when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, this is the, the serpent, uh, a very poisonous serpent, by the way, uh, hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. See, they already know that, listen, they know the good and the bad. And, and, and the interesting thing is, as you read this, uh, and you can read it in, in other versions that calls them the barbarians, the natives. They even see that there's, a, that there's a God. And that God punishes evil. And that there's good and that there's evil. And how, how do people know this? How do we know this? Even in today's society. And that's what I say with atheists when they go, oh, you know, there's no God, no God, no God. But then if you do something wrong, they go, you can't do that. You're a Christian. That's wrong. Well, who are you to say what's right and wrong? You have no morals. You're no absolutes. Who are you to judge me? You've already said we came from nothing and everybody lives their own truth. Even the atheists know that God exists and they know the good and the evil. They understand it. They, they won't admit it, but they clearly say it when they, when they challenge you of what you believe or what you don't believe or what is right and what is wrong. And so we see that God has put it into every man. And that's what, that's what we see here. God says, listen, every man knows of me. People say, well, what about those that are out in a far, far land that are, are, are you know, have never heard of Jesus, so on and so forth? Well, if, if, we, if we look at it and go, well, it's not fair that they go to hell if they never heard of Jesus. 
Which I would say you're right. That wouldn't be fair, but here's the problem. God put the knowledge of his existence in every human being. So he's already covered that. And then not only has he covered it, but if you look up here, it says, and, and if you go to uh, 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Clearly, like he doesn't say that they're visible. Like somewhere over the horizon, I think I see it, but I'm really not. No, no, no. He says they are clearly seen. So you can't even deny God because he says I've already put it in them and it's clearly seen. And then he goes on being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God says, listen, I'm telling you, they know right from wrong. Every man has a conscience, and the reason they have a conscience is because God put it in every man to, what, to do right from wrong, and they clearly understand it, and they know it's from him. They can clearly see him. Now, when people go, well, you know, I don't, uh, I don't think so because uh, I believe in science, and science doesn't prove there's a God. Are you kidding me? That's all science does is prove there's a God. I mean, everything is in such order, uh, and, and it's amazing. I'm, I'm going to tell you, schools today, they have one agenda, and that is to preach lies, or te I'm sorry, teach lies. And, uh, and the teaching of the lies is this. Uh, we came from nothing. It's a big bang. Uh, er, you know, it, okay. If I, let, let's just use money, for example, because everybody can relate to money. Amen? All right. So if I say... Listen, Jim, give me $100, and, but you have zero money on you, okay? But I say, give me $100. What are you going to tell me? Uh, I gotta go out no, you have zero money. I already told you what you're going to tell me. <laughs> I don't have any money on you. Yeah, I have nothing. I have no money, right? Okay, I have no money. Well, well give it to me anyway. No, you say, I have no money. Yeah, just stick with that line. I have no money. Well, surely you can make $100 out of zero, can't you? No, I can't. You can't. So give me $100. I, I, I no, I have no, I have no money. Okay. So <laughs> what happens is because Jim has no money, and he clearly made everybody understand that, <laughs> because Jim has no money, he can't give me $100. So then I'm going to go, okay, you know what? Since you have, you have no money, no give me a dollar. I have, get, give me a dollar. Come on, dude, you can sure make something out of nothing. I have no money. Okay, nice. Yes, he got it. So, <laughs> see, the thing is, he has no money because he has no truck right now. You see what I'm saying? He can't run out there. But I say, give me something out of nothing. But I have no money. It's kind of like me or telling you when I'm teaching on tithing and I say, you know what? You need to tithe 10%. Well, how can I tithe 10% of zero? What's 10% of zero? zero? Zero. It's still nothing. You can't create something out of nothing, but yet the schools will teach you that. The schools will teach you that, bang! That was for those who were sleeping. <laughs> that all of a sudden, we have this wonderful universe in perfect order out of an explosion. Well, that's crazy. <laughs> so then I, I and, I've, and I've had these conversations. Well, okay, listen. Out of the explosion, uh, what happened? Well, there was a warm puddle of water. And, uh, and there was a lightning bolt that hit it. Boom! And the amoeba came out of it. Anybody ever hear that one? <laughs> or am I the only one? Okay. Making sure that I'm not the only one. Uh, and, and, I, and I go, but wait a minute, wait a minute. How can there be a warm puddle of water when there was nothing? Where did the puddle of water come from? Well, it's the atmosphere below. Okay, so let's go to the amoeba. <laughs> so the amoeba crawls out of this warm puddle of water. I'm really curious how it got warm to begin with, but it's all right. <laughs> so the amoeba crawls out of this warm puddle of water that got struck by lightning. And by the way, Anybody ever see somebody get struck by lightning? It doesn't help them. I'm just kind of saying. <laughs> and, but at any rate, this amoeba is formed and it grows out. And, and, and so now we go from the simple to the complex. Uh, how many teachers are here? 
Yeah, they're like, I ain't even getting involved. <laughs> I'm not <gonna. laughs> We go from the simple to the complex, but here's the interesting thing. The amoeba actually has more atoms in it than what we do. So it's actually more complex. You, you can study it out. But at any rate, so it comes out and, 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 and it's, it, I don't know, it grows into something else and then something else and something else and then it gets a tail and then it hangs from a tree and then the tail drops off and it goes, starts walking because it happened to land on two feet and stood up and went, what just happened? And started walking and then, and then it, it, it like grew into us. I mean, it's right. This is where we're at. But then my question is, okay, if, if something came from nothing, uh, we'll just go with that. Uh, it's kind of hard for me to grab hold of, but something came from nothing. Um, the amoeba came first. Would that be a yes? Right? Is that what came? Somebody help me. Is that what came first, or what we're taught came first? <laughs> Here's my question: It breathes oxygen. Where did the trees come from? Where did the plants come from to produce the oxygen for the amoeba to breathe? I, I don't know. Another Big Bang. I, I don't know. Maybe it came into the tree and then the tree produced fruit and dropped the amoeba because the amoeba was part of the fruit. I, I don't get it. I don't know. But, but here's my thing. God says, listen, in my creation, and I'm not trying to mock anybody. I'm just simply trying to grab hold of and understand. And God says, through my creation, the, the organization of everything. Do you realize your eyeball? They can't even make, and, and man's, all a man's intelligence cannot even make a lens as perfect as the eyeball. It is so intricately designed to do amazing things. And that just happened? If you go back to Genesis and you, and you look at Genesis and you look at the order of everything that, that happens, you will see everything happen in an order for the next stage to survive. We have a creator. I mean, if, if I took a watch and I put it in a tumbler, and, and, and first I took it all apart because the designer built it to run, but since we only have it because the designer built it, uh, now i got to take it all apart. And I'm going to throw it in a tumbler, and we're just going to tumble this thing for, I don't know, 350 billion years. We'll just, we'll just tumble it. Will it ever come out a watch again? No. Guys, there's nothing random, and that's what God says. Listen, you can see me. First off, you can see me. The, the first way that, that Paul makes it clear is you know I exist from your conscience because God says I've put it into your conscience. The second way you know I exist is because you can look around. You can see it in order. You can see it in design. How, how interesting is it that when you look at male and female and that they, they procreate, in any other way than that, it's not going to happen. And by the way, uh, you know, you can't see a dog and a cat get together and, and uh, whatever it would be. But it doesn't happen. Why? Because God said each one will be after its own kind. You don't see an oak tree grow a pine tree. It's just it's not going to, it's never going to happen. Why? Because each thing grows after its own kind. Now, now they can infuse the two today and, and get a, a, a poke tree. I don't know, whatever you'd want to call it. But, but you understand what I'm saying. And so God says, listen, as you, as you look at my creation, as you, as you look at everything that's unfolded, you will see, not only that I put it in you so your conscience tells you that I exist, every man, but now you can look around. And you can see I exist because of what is there and how it operates and how everything. Look at the four seasons. Look at a tree. Do you realize every year the tree dies? Do you realize that? Everything in that tree drops all the way down to the trunk in the wintertime. And then in springtime, it takes a little longer here than somewhere else, but... Then in springtime, all of a sudden that tree comes back to life again. Do you think that just happened? You know, I think God's biggest joke to man was the platypus. <laughs> to this day, it still has scientists going, what has happened here? And they try to explain it, but you can't explain it because it's only of God. 
And so God says, listen, not only is your conscience that I put it on your conscience, but you know what? I also put it in my creation. But here was the problem. Verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Well, here's what happens. They responded uh, with indifference. Indifference toward God. And, and you know, wicked man wants nothing to do with God. But here's the interesting thing. Look at this text. Verse 21 says, by the way, if, if you have your Bibles, I, I want you to follow along. Romans 1, 21. Because, although, what's the next three words? What is it? Although they knew God, and yet they responded with indifference. But the Bible says they knew him. Don't you find that interesting? We think, oh God, is, you know, how can somebody die without Jesus and they'd never heard of Jesus? But what does the Bible say? They knew God. They knew him. How did they know him? I just told you. He put it into the conscience of every man. But man has decided to ignore God. Man willfully rejected what God revealed. But we see that all the time, don't we? The next thing in 121, they responded with ingratitude. Look here in 121. 21 it says they uh, although they knew God they did not glorify him as God nor were thankful um, isn't it amazing how people today we, we, we probably have the most unthankful society ever today even kids are so unthankful to their parents they're, they're just their parents give them everything which is probably the first mistake but then the kids expect more and more, and they're not even thankful for what they get. And so if they're not thankful for a parent that they can see, how thankful are they to a God they can't see? Amen. Nor were they thankful. So they responded with indifference. They didn't glorify him. They responded with ingratitude. Uh, they were not thankful. And by the way, Psalm 104 says this, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Colossians 3.15 says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. And I'm going to tell you, uh, uh, ingratitude is a step away from God. So even if you're a Christian and you're not thankful for what God has given you, by the way, the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from above. It comes from Him. And you know, some of us, we are full of ingratitude. We're not even thankful for that. Man, there's, I tell you, I get up and, and it's, it, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm easy. I'll, I turn on the water and I go, man, praise God I don't have to go outside and pump the water and carry a bucket into the house. Or, better yet, you got to go to the bathroom. Praise God, it's minus 30 degrees and I have a heated house and a heated throne. Amen. <laughs> right? But in gratitude, how many of you have stopped to thank God for even the littlest thing? Just the littlest thing, the smallest thing. And then they responded with ignorance. Because it says here in 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. You know, it's amazing, and I was talking about school, uh, how colleges today are teaching no God, no God, no God, no God. Not K-N-O-W, but N-O. Uh, no God. And then they, they brought in philosophy. We, we heard that, didn't we? In 1965, what do we do to destroy America? Bring in philosophy and get rid of religion. Well, if you get rid of religion, you get rid of God. But the truth is, uh, with, without religion, there's no relationship. You're, you're never going to hear about God without uh, religion, without coming to church, without uh, understanding. And so it says here, they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts was darkened. The interesting thing is, the word imaginations speaks of the thought process. 
And it carries the idea of deliberating and coming to a conclusion. The word vain means empty, futile, or worthless. The word darkened speaks of the absence of light or the absence of God. And so the tragedy is that lost men love the darkness. John 3.19 says this, And this is the condemnation that the light has came, come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And really what it's saying is that men love Satan more than they love Jesus. Because their mind was more on doing wrong than it was doing right. And I can prove it to you because when you talk to somebody about Jesus, and then a lot of times they'll say, but if I accept Jesus, i got to give up this lifestyle, or i got to quit doing this, or i got to quit doing that. And so therefore, I love my sin more than I want to give it up, and uh, I'm not interested in Jesus. And so in their minds, they became futile, and they became foolish. And we see this. Scriptures... Uh, uh, are very clear with it, uh, which took me to, they responded with intellectualism, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Twice in the Bible, uh, it says in Psalm 14.1, uh, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, they are corrupt, they have done ab abominable works, there is none who does good. And then in Psalm 53.1, it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and have done abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. Twice in the Bible. So when you talk to somebody and they go, well, there's no God, they're a fool. They're a fool. And most people today, they, they justify it. They, they try to, to uh, uh, explain away God and, and live for themselves. And God says, they are a fool. The word fool in our text does not mean that they were mentally deficient, but describes someone who has moved from God's light into darkness and therefore has no spiritual discernment. And so God's talking about the spiritual. And he says, you know what? If you don't believe there's a God, you are a fool. And yet, that's all we see uh, happening today. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man, the natural man is is someone who does not believe in Jesus. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned or spiritually lacking. And so the first uh, uh, litmus test, if you would, for, for a lost person, or even somebody who claims to be a Christian, if, if you go up to them and you point out a passage and they go, I don't believe that. They're spiritually discerned. And so if they think they're a Christian, but they don't believe, listen, even the person that just got saved, if you pointed out a scripture and verse or, uh, uh, in the Bible, a passage in the Bible, uh, they'll go, wow, that's interesting. I never knew that. Oh, that's a difficult one to handle. Oh, man, I'm going to struggle with that one. But they never deny it. And so if you have people that deny scripture, they're lost. They're lost. They're not saved. And so if somebody, anybody, and I don't care if they went to church for 30 years and they deny parts of this, they're lost. They're not of God. They're spiritually ignorant, spiritually lacking, spiritually depraved. What a litmus test. How many, how many times have I talked to Christians and I point out a verse and they go, oh, I can't, I, I, no, I, don't, I, I can't believe that. Well, of course you can't. You don't know Jesus. What do you mean? How dare you judge me? I didn't judge you. The Word of God judged you. And so we have to be so careful. Jesus said in Luke 24, 25, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Foolish ones. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote, We are dealing with an intellectualism today that is cultic. Men seem to worship the brain. And then he goes on, The whole drift toward modernism that has blighted the church of God and nearly destroyed its living gospel may be traced to an hour when men began to turn from revelation to, prophet, uh, to philosophy. And that's what our whole country focuses on. Our colleges focus on, our schools focus on from the time of kindergarten. 
You know, we're getting ready to go into some hard passages that talks about homosexuality, but yet we have, and how wrong it is. The Bible says it's wrong. And I've had people who come up to me, and they said, Pastor, I'll never come to your church again. And I'm, why? Because you talked about homosexuality. No, the Bible talks about it. I have no choice, and we're coming into it. So guys, hold on. But yet, in California, and, and they're trying to push it into all states, where it is mandated that kindergartners are taught the alternative lifestyle. Why? Because man believes in philosophy, not religion, not God. And so that takes us to the next one. They responded with idolatry. In Romans 1.23 and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Man makes their own God. Here's the interesting thing. If you go back in a, into Genesis and you, you read, uh, or you go back in, in with Moses, remember he goes up onto the mountain and, and, um, and Aaron makes this, this calf because they said, make us a calf. And he said, well, give us all your gold, which is really interesting because all their gold was all their wealth. And he melted it down and he made this, this glorious calf. Interesting also that when Moses came down, he said, how'd this happen? And Aaron went, I don't know. <laughs> right? That's what he did. He, he like denies it. But the interesting thing that I find is that the people said, make us a God that we can worship. And so they want a golden calf. They get a golden calf. But did they not realize they can destroy their own God? How is that a God? How is a tree a God? How is a rock a God? It, it, it amazes me, but that's that intellectual man coming out and it has become foolish, the Bible says. And so they responded with idolatry. It said, when man rejects the true God, he does not cease to be religious. He simply creates his own God. Many times he creates God in his own image. Man is a religious creature, so he will worship something or someone. And then the last point. They responded with insult. 125. Look here, 125. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie? Have you ever told the truth, the outright truth, the absolute blatant truth, and somebody called you a liar? How frustrated did you get? You're like, but no, I'm telling you the truth. No, I don't believe it. No, listen, I'm telling you the truth. No, I don't believe it. That's what happened here. 25, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. The psalmist said that God had magnified his word, now listen, above his name. In Psalm 138.2, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word, not Jesus, your word, if you study that out, it's literally his, his word. You have magnified your word above all your name. And yet man will take this and absolutely deny it and say it's a lie. And so they just insult God. I just want you to know today that God is real. And he's true and he's holy and he's righteous and he's just. And his wrath will be poured out on us that do, that do not believe. And we'll pay the price. Doesn't matter whether you think it's truth or not. See, here's the beautiful thing about truth. Truth is truth regardless of what you believe. Truth is not dependent upon you. And so many people think, well, I don't believe it. You don't have to believe it. It's still truth. It has, listen, truth has nothing to do with you. Either you believe it or you don't believe it, but that's your option. And I'm just telling you today that God said in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against. That means anybody ungodly and unrighteous, those who do not believe Jesus Christ as their Savior, God's wrath will be poured out on you. 
And you go, Pastor, that's not fun. I know it's not fun. And I also know this. Satan did not want me preaching on this. I'm telling you guys, you have no clue how, how under attack I have been. I typically don't have anxiety attacks. Man, before I got up here to preach, I had sharp pains in my side. I could hardly breathe. I couldn't take a deep breath. And it came on just like that. I'm telling you, Satan does not want you guys to hear the truth. Satan wants you to walk in feeling good and walk out feeling good, but he doesn't want you to hear the absolute truth. Well, God does. God doesn't want you to be ignorant. He doesn't want you to be foolish. He doesn't want you believing in what you think is right. He wants you to believe in what he said is right. And your destination, being heaven or hell, will truly be determined upon your decision and your decision only on whether you believe the word of God or you don't. Nothing else. Nothing else is weighed into the factor of whether you go to heaven or hell. Nothing else is weighed into that process other than do you believe Jesus Christ as the Son of God died for your sins and are you willing to believe that he's your Savior or do you say it's a bunch of malarkey, I don't want nothing to do with it, I'm going to take my philosophy because it sounds better. Your decision determines your destination. Your, listen, your everyday decision determines whether you're blessed by God. Your everyday decision in your walk determines everything about what God's going to do in your life through you and for you. And if you run when it gets tough, you're going to miss it. And, I, and I'm just going to tell you right now, guys, we are in a spiritual, spiritual warfare. A battle like you've never been in before. And as for a Christian, a true Christian, a real Christian, one who's willing to live and die on the Word of God, you are going to get tested. And you're going to get pushed. And you're going to get hammered. And you're going to get pounded. The, the people say, oh, you got religion because it's a crutch. Boy, I wish that were true. The hardest thing I've ever done was walk for Jesus Christ. The hardest thing I've ever done is stand up and speak truth, knowing that I'm going to lose friends, knowing that family's going to walk away, knowing I'm going to be left all alone, and me and Jesus standing there, and that's it. Christianity's not a crutch, and it's not anything easy. It's going to be the hardest decision you ever make in your life. Am I going to live righteous? Am I going to do what's right? Am I going to do what's godly, regardless of the cost of what people think or do to me? How many remember the, the 21 men that were beheaded on the beach because they were Christians? Do you guys remember seeing that in the news? One of the interesting articles that I read was one of the guys there was actually not a Christian. And he was, he was at the end of the row. So they, they started down here and they went one by one asking these men, if they were Christian, if they believed in Jesus Christ, they gave them an opportunity to deny Christ. Deny Christ or die. And they said, I'll not deny my Jesus, my Lord. And they get to the last man. And they said, is Jesus Christ your God? And he said, their God is my God. He didn't know Jesus. But he knew the Jesus that they were all talking about. And when he gets down there, he says, I believe in the God they believe in. Their God is my God. And they beheaded him. I'm going to tell you, man, take the stand. It's not going to be easy. It's never easy. And if it's easy, you're not living for Christ. If you've never been spiritually uh, in, in a battle, you're not doing anything for Jesus. If your life is gravy cakes, psh, man, you're not doing anything for Jesus. And so I'm just telling you right here, when you look at this, God's wrath is poured out on those who do not believe in Jesus Christ. Where are you at? Where are you at spiritually? You know, some of you are sitting in your chairs and you're ignoring me, and that's fine. That's your option. And some of you think I'm crazy or I'm just this holy cupcake, and that's okay. Because I don't have to answer for you. You have to answer for you. 
You might be sitting there thinking, I don't need church. I'm here because my mama made me. God bless you, mama. <laughs> and you're going to walk out of here thinking that this is all crazy and this is all crazy because you're young and foolish and don't know any better. But I'm telling each and every one of you today, and I guess the reason that I just have no humor in me today is because I've had the snot beat out of me all week. And man, I don't want anybody to die and go to hell. Nobody. Nobody, not one. I can't force you to believe. It's your option. But understand this. If you deny Jesus Christ, you will go to hell. You will feel the wrath of God. There's no other escape but through Jesus. I'd like every head bowed, every eye closed. And I'm not going to take up a whole lot of time on, the, on, on closing out here. But if you're here today, here's what I want you to do. If you're here and you thought, man, pastor up there, that man up there, he's just crazy. That's fine. But I want you to ask yourself this. If I don't believe Jesus is the only way, how can I save myself? How can I deliver myself from the wrath of God? How can I deliver myself from this ugliness that, that the Bible talks about? How can I deliver myself from this spiritual battle that's going on? And as you're thinking of the answer, I want you to think of one more question. How can I cure myself when I have the common cold? I just want it a little bit easier. We can't even heal ourselves with a common cold, let alone save our life. We need Jesus. There is no other way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no person gets to the Father in heaven but through me. And so if you're here today and you don't know that you're going to go to heaven when you die, and, and I'm going to make it real easy on you to figure that one out. If you don't believe the Bible in its entirety to be, uh, in its entirety to be absolute 100% truth, you're not going to heaven. That's, that's just simple. I don't want to make this difficult for anybody. And so if that's you, I'm just going to give you an opportunity of a lifetime with the understanding that you're not promised tomorrow and you could leave this building, God forbid, but you can get into a car accident and never make it to your destination. You could have a brain aneurysm and never make it to your destination. You could have a heart attack. You could have a multitude of things happen and you... Your life is over just that quick. Nobody's promised tomorrow. You're not guaranteed another moment. And so if your desire today is to receive Christ as your Savior, to believe on His name, then you pray this prayer. And understand, the, the, the words do not get you to heaven. They're just simply a road map to walk you through the process so that you have something, a time and a day, that you can say, this is when I receive Christ as my Savior, so that when Satan attacks, you can remind him of the day that you prayed and received Christ. So if it's your desire to receive Christ as your Savior, you pray this prayer, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong. But today, I ask forgiveness for all the wrong I've ever done. Today, I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross and you died for my sins and you rose the third day. I believe you're at the right hand of the Father. And I believe that through you, I can have life and have life everlasting. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. But I do want to rejoice with you. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it in your heart, they weren't just lip service or words that you prayed for an escape route from hell, but you truly meant them. Would you just raise your hand so I can rejoice with you? I promise you I will not embarrass you. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? 
Today I ask Jesus to be my Savior. Amen. You can put your hand down. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, for the one who raised their hand, Lord, I pray right now that your strength and power be upon him. Lord, I pray that you keep Satan at bay, Lord, that as he grows and learns, Lord, that, that, that he would be strengthened and encouraged, and Lord, that he would stay in the pocket, your pocket. And so, Lord, I just pray your hand upon him. Lord, for those who are here today and they're struggling with this decision, Lord, they're struggling because the world has taught them philosophy and foolishness. Lord, I pray that you would give them clarity of thought. Lord, that you would allow them to look at a tree like they've never looked at it before. Lord, they, they would look up in the sky and see the clouds and see them in all your glory. Lord, they would look at the sun and see that you made the sun and you made the moon and you made the stars. And Lord, not only did you make them, but you hung them there. Lord, you planted the grass and the flowers. Lord, all the beauty that we just take in every day and take for granted. Lord, as we see new life coming onto the trees as spring is upon us. Lord, I pray right now for every person that when they see it, Lord, they just wouldn't see the flower bloom or the tree grow leaves and the grass grow, but Lord, that they would see your mighty hand doing it. Lord, they would see that you created that, Lord, that you made that. And Lord, that their thought wouldn't be how beautiful, but their thought would be, oh, how thankful. Lord, I, Lord, I love you. And Lord, I ask that you forgive me for wanting to run. Lord, I ask that you forgive me for where I fail. But Lord, I want to thank you for strengthening me. Lord, I want to thank you for always being there. Lord, you never leave us. You never forsake us. And Lord, I just, I just want to thank you for that. And Lord, help us to never, ever take that for granted. Lord, for those who are believing the lie, Lord, just remind them of who you are, however you do that. Lord, that none would perish. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We at Connecting Point Church are excited to have you join us. When you come, you'll experience a friendly, lively, and casual family-like atmosphere that welcomes you as you are. Our messages combine straightforward biblical truths, humor, and life-changing challenges for you to learn and grow in God's Word. We believe in connecting people to Christ, to the plans and gifts He has for them, and with people in our community who share these values. We also believe in reaching out to our local area and the regions beyond. We're dedicated to being a place where your entire family can believe, belong, and become all that God intends you to be. Discover the abundance of life in Jesus Christ as you begin to understand the roots of the problems and learn to apply the tools for you to triumph over your challenges today. It'll be a breath of fresh air in this unsettled world.